Hello, this is Mel Weinstein, host of the Food Labels Revealed podcast. This is the eighth episode. The podcast is still just a baby, cutting its teeth on the complex world of processed foods. For today's show, I'm going to take a departure from the food ingredient investigations to talk about the subject of merchandising. Long before you get to the label on a food package to evaluate whether it's good for you or not, there are various influences at play that may be unconsciously directing you to a particular product. Some of those influences are need, desire, habit, coupon incentives, advertising, marketing, product placement, and merchandising. That latter influence, merchandising, is probably the one influence that people are least familiar with. That's what I'll be exploring today. For those of you new to the podcast, I have a 30-plus year background in chemistry education, food testing, and chemical research. And for many years, I've had a fascination with what we eat, what's inside of what we eat, and what it might be doing to us. Based on my experience in the processed food industry, I bring an informed opinion to the subject of food ingredients. One last thing before getting to the thrust of the show. This podcast is available all over the place, including iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Play, and YouTube. Show notes are available at the website podbean.com, that's P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com, and also at YouTube, and you can search under Food Labels Revealed. And, as always, like, comment, subscribe where possible. If you have any questions or comments, I can always be contacted at foodlabelsrevealed at gmail.com. That's all one string for Food Labels Revealed. Thanks for listening. I got exposed to the business of merchandising as a student in college. One summer, I couldn't find a full-time job, so I signed up with a temp agency. For one job, they sent me to a drugstore to help some companies stock products near the checkout counters. The guy that I was helping told me that he was a merchandiser, and it was his job to set up a display to attract customers to buy the products he was hawking. This guy didn't work for the drugstore. He was a professional merchandiser hired by companies to set up displays in various stores. I learned that the drugstore was paid for the location of the display and that the real estate in a retail store was a very viable commodity. The lesson was lost on me at that time, but, but now I know that the setup and placement of products in stores is very purposely done, that a great deal of psychology goes into the, into the design of retail stores, and that shoppers are subtly, and maybe not so subtly, influenced in their buying decisions. In other words, some of us consumers get played. That's what I want to look at in today's episode. Let's start with the definition of merchandising. Turning to my old friend, Wikipedia, merchandising is any practice which contributes to the sale of products to a retail customer or consumer. Merchandising refers to the variety of products available for sale and the display of those products in such a way that it stimulates interest and entices customers to make a purpose. End of quote there. I'm going to talk about nine merchandising techniques, some of which you may be familiar with, but others might be new to you. To illustrate these techniques, we'll take a tour through my local grocery store. Because of the visual nature of this podcast, I, I highly recommend that you watch the YouTube version that has the photos of my grocery store. But if that's not available, that's okay. You should still be able to follow along. So let's get started. Technique number one. I'm calling entry traps. The entryway to the store is set up to grab your attention and to display items you might want to grab quickly. The entryway is where the carts are herded. So that when you enter the store, you're looking for a cart or a basket. But right there in front of you is a display of donuts. Donuts? What is that doing there? Cravings. It's all about cravings and impulse purchasing. You weren't going into the store to buy donuts, but now they're staring you in the face. Can you pass them by? 
Other items you might see are seasonal items like fruits or vegetables that the store needs to move quickly or they'll spoil. So even as you enter the store, various items are being hawked to you. Technique number two is entitled the feel-good area. This is the first department you run into after entering the store. It's there to establish a good impression. This is the sensory stimulation area. Sights and smells abound. In my grocery store, you immediately encounter beautiful flowers and plants, a bakery with sweet smells wafting around your head, the deli counter with ready-to-eat take-home items, a salad bar, a sushi bar, it even has Asian food preparers, and the exotic cheese display. In other stories, your first encounter might be the fruits and vegetables department. Same idea. The purpose of the feel-good area is to stimulate your appetite. The bakery has the largest square footage, and you can't walk beyond this section without moving past display after display of sugary, fat-filled, gustatory delights. Look at what I see when I walk through this section of the store. Tables of cookies, muffins, cakes, cupcakes, treat breads, and pies. Fortunately for me, I can quickly walk through the baked goods section since I don't eat anything with dairy or egg in it. Otherwise, because of my humongous sweet tooth, I'd routinely be stuffing my cart with these items and probably weigh 50 pounds more than I am now. Technique number three is called Produce Delights section. Here we have the beautiful sights of the produce section. The purpose is to give you an immediate impression of freshness and naturalness. Often, the produce section is well lit, so everything looks very appealing. In the back of the produce section, there's a long row of cases where select vegetables are periodically sprayed with water to enhance the impression of freshness. It's strange, but even produce in plastic bags get sprayed with water. Have you ever noticed how the produce tables are staggered and have different shapes? So you just can't beeline your way through this area very easily. The management, of course, wants you to linger a while because some of the highest markups occur with produce sales. The idea is to maximize your time in the store and thereby the money you spend. Another way that's done is moving items around in the store. Sometimes when you finally get comf comfortable knowing the locations of frequently bought items, the management switches things around. So now it takes you longer to do your shopping. More time in the store equals more money spent, right? One time in my grocery store, they rearranged the whole center of the store. I was so disoriented and couldn't find anything that I, I just wanted to run out of the store screaming. Something like, why did you do this to me? All right, let's go on to technique number four called soothing music. Studies show that you will take your time moving through a store when you hear music. Want to know if your supermarket is messing with your head? Listen to what type of music's being played. Most likely you will hear depressing music from the 80s and 90s. And that's because it makes you put more stuff in your cart. Supposedly music in a major chord with a slower beat is statistically proven to sell more groceries. Why? Because we slow down. We spend more time in the store because we're walking slower and enjoying ourselves. All this means is that we end up putting more stuff in our cart. Next time you're in the store, pay attention to the music. Then learn to block it out. Technique number five has the title Product Location. The center aisles of the store contain most of the processed packaged foods. The most popular items are often in the center of the aisle, forcing customers to get exposed to numerous products at the front and or end of the aisle before locating what they're looking for. In the center aisles, shelf space is a premium. Now think about shelf space. There's a limited amount of it. There are an estimated in excess of 100,000 products available to grocers. 
but the average grocery store has room for only about 40,000. Okay, I'll say that again. There's a potential for 100,000 products. The grocery store, typical grocery store, will only stock about 40,000. So there's 60,000 products that aren't going to get any shelf time. So how do stores decide what to stock? One way is through the use of what is called slotting fees. This practice started in the 1970s, whereby food companies pay fees to grocery stores for the placement of new food items on the shelves. By paying a fee, the food company is guaranteed that their new product will get displayed for a reasonable period of time before the grocer decides to dump it or keep it. There can be big bucks involved here. If a new product is introduced nationwide, the slotting feeds can add up to millions of dollars. Technique number six, entitled shelf placement. Continuing with the grocery shelves, where the packaged food product sits on the shelf really matters. There's no such thing as haphazard placement. One rule of thumb is eye level is by level, meaning that the products positioned at eye level or just below are likely to sell better and sometimes the more expensive items will be found on shelves at the eye level. That area, the second and third shelves from the top, is called the bullseye zone. The products on the bottom shelves, even though they may be less expensive and better buys, may be skipped over since more effort will be required to bend down and grab them. Those products may include store brands and bulk items. Now if kids are being targeted, for example by cereals, they are typically placed at thigh level, which is eye level for kids. The top shelf tends to be reserved for lesser known brands, regional brands, or gourmet stuff. The smaller food companies don't have the moolah for the slotting fees, so they take what they can get. In my grocery store, I buy a cheap, non-popular oatmeal cereal. The store merchandisers lace that oatmeal on the highest shelf. And being a short guy, sometimes they need to step up on the first shelf just to reach that top shelf. They certainly don't make it easy on me. Technique number seven is called the enticement of end caps. Have you seen those cases at the end of the center aisles that are full of apparent sale items? Those displays get switched out frequently. They're called end caps. The most profitable impulse buys are placed on the end caps. The layout of the store assures that customers will pass as many end caps as possible. Just like slotting fees, manufacturers will pay for that prime real estate. Often the products placed on end caps are not actually on sale, so beware. The prices are manipulated to make you think you are getting a bargain. Technique number eight, way in the back. The rear of the store is where the staples, such as eggs, dairy, and meat, are strategically located. By placing these items in the back, customers are forced to walk through various aisles to get to them. Along the way, people may very well get tempted to pick up other items. Surveys show that roughly 60% or more of what you buy in the grocery store was not on your original shopping list. That's the definition of impulse buying. The store wants you to move in what is called the golden triangle, the route from the front door to the back of the store and then to the checkout. Technique number nine, and this is the last technique, is called point of purchase sales. We all know about impulse purchases. We go into a store with certain intentions about what we want to buy, but then some items catch your eye, stimulate our brains or appetites, and we wind up tossing them in our cart. Stores know all about those cues, which cause us to ratchet up our spending. Those allures are maxed out at the point of purchase, better known as the checkout lane. That area of the grocery store is one of the most profitable, possibly eight times as much as other parts of the store. That's the place where we are most vulnerable. 
since we may be stuck in a line with time on our hands and our eyes start wandering to the cases lining the checkout area. That's where, in addition to the tabloid magazines, we'll see an assortment of candy, gum, chips, and snack cakes. A fairly recent addition to checkout lanes are the refrigerated cases with soda, energy drinks, and other unhealthy beverages, and maybe some bottled water as the least perilous choice. Have you noticed that these not-so-healthy items are situated at just the right height to attract the attention of children? Your thigh level, their eye level. Unless you happen to get into a fast-moving checkout line, you're kind of trapped in this part of the store, a stationary target, so to speak. One day, I was in a checkout lane of my grocery store when I spotted a little tray of, guess what, Reese's Peanut Butter Pumpkin Cups just sitting there above the card reader. Yes, that's what I said. It was sitting there above the card reader, not with the rest of the candy. That really took chutzpah. Do we have the willpower to resist this kind of blatant impulse purchasing? Maybe yes, maybe no. But when moving through this part of the store, I suggest keep your head facing forward. Stare at the back of the person in front of you. When it's your turn, place your items on the checkout belt and don't look anywhere else. Get your credit card, check, or cash ready and be prepared to leave the store quickly. Hey, uh, one last thing uh, about merchandising. Nowadays, every decent grocery store has a natural foods section. Have you ever wondered why the words natural foods are used? Doesn't that imply that all the other foods in the grocery store are unnatural foods? Think about it. That's it for today's show. Even though I didn't talk about any specific food item and its ingredients, I think understanding merchandising is an important part of educating ourselves about how and why we purchase foods in a grocery store. By understanding the psychology of merchandising, we become aware of how we are played as customers, and then we can make wiser and more informed decisions about what we buy. With that knowledge, not only will we make healthier choices, but we should also be able to lower our food bills. So, the next time you're in a grocery store, pay attention to the placement of things. Ignore the assaults on your senses and cravings. Stick to your grocery list. Block out the music. Engage tunnel vision in the checkout line. And, in general, be more single-minded about your purchases. Farewell, food eaters. And remember this. If you want to eat well and keep yourself healthy, Eat food mainly from natural plants, not manufacturing plants. So long.